So we're going to have our speakers come back for panel discussion. And as they're making their way to the stage, I'd just like to say that um, if you couldn't see that defect that Dr. Schauber showed you, I couldn't see it either. So, <laughs> so that's why he's the expert in the field and, and I am not. Um, also, just a, la a few last announcements. Um, once again, regarding your CME, in the next three business days, you will receive an email from UT Southwestern CME office. It's an evaluation of the program. Once you complete the evaluation of the program, your certificate will pop up and you can print that out. For all of our technologists that are here, you just turn that into the ASRT, okay? Um, also, all of your guidebook information, every slide we've presented today will be available to you for the next 30 days on the guidebook. So if you didn't download it today, go home, go back to that email, download that content and you will have that. And then when we release the videos, we will send you an announcement. Now, for those of you who have downloaded the phone app, the UT Southwestern RADS phone app, you will get your announcement on your phone. So I encourage you again to do that. It also has the telephone numbers, how to reach us. It has many resources. And if you didn't pick up the little parting gift, you know, you can at least take that home to the kids. All right, that said, we're going to entertain questions oh, for our speakers. The table and, he's like, okay, I'm there. I have him and as we're making our way to the podium, I do have one already um, for Dr. Colombo. Uh, regarding uh, treatment for varicose veins, does that apply to your average, uh, let's just say, female patient that is postpartum that has varicose veins? Are they at risk of developing those ulcers? Is this something that has to be treated? Um, they are at risk, not, um, they're, are you, do you mean like for younger women who have varicose veins? Yes. They most likely aren't going to get those ulcers um, because they're probably going to be a little more active and their venous reflux isn't going to be quite as bad as you'll see in an older patient, but they, they do need to get them treated. They're still going to experience all of the other symptoms, which, you know, the achy legs, heavy tiredness, swelling, um, and they absolutely can come and get treatment. Yeah. Any questions from the audience before I take the next quick question? All right, this is for Dr. Chabra. Uh, we've seen some of our patients that have presented to ERs around the Metroplex. If they have an injury to their hip, do they need a CT of their hip? Thank you. As I mentioned before, first they should get an X-ray. And if the X-ray is negative, um, there's nothing displaced, they probably don't need anything. But if you see a little amount of effusion or they are focally tender there or you see the, weak, the bone is weak, it's osteopenic, you could proceed to MRI at that point. Uh, but if nothing is displaced, you don't see a fracture, they don't need a CT. Thank you. And this question is for Dr. Steele. How long after a vertebral fracture has been noticed on the x-ray can you still have your patient undergo vertebral plastic? Um, we can do vertebroplasty as, as long out as if, if they're still symptomatic and they still have active um, inflammatory change on their MRI, so there's no time limit. <clears throat> Some patients, a lot of patients will um, resolve that fracture and, and heal it on their own, but if they're six or seven weeks out or it's affecting their daily activity, um, we don't really put a time limit on, on that if they still have you know, active edema, inflammatory change, and, and that relates to their symptoms, then we can treat them. Does it usually result, um, if you have an untreated vertebral fracture, is that going to result in any type of uh, posture, kyphosis, et cetera, that could still be treated even if the patient is not symptomatic? So the goal of the treatment is not to restore height of that, of that vertebral body. I don't, I'm not aware of any um, treatment modalities that actually restore that height, and they are going to become progressively more kyphotic. Um, and, and a lot of our patients who are osteoporotic, the longer you wait, sometimes that collapse um, progresses. Um, and so once that height loss is gone and they're more kyphotic, we can't really correct that. All we can do is sort of stabilize that fracture to help it to heal. So there's, there's no real change or height loss that we can help. Do we have a question from the audience? Here on the left. One there. All right, this question is for Dr. Palumbo. 
I want to know how far apart was the pre and post treatment imaging of the fibroids? And then the second question is, uh, do you treat all uterine fibroids with the IR treatment? Like subsoil, so it doesn't matter which location or is it a particular location of the fibroids? Those are both really great questions. The picture I was showing were actually in the procedure, so those images were taken within minutes of each other. Do you, do you mean the angiography images I was showing you? Yeah, that is real time in the procedure. Um, one was right before we delivered those beads, and then the other picture is right after we delivered those small particles. So that's, that's immediate. We cut off the blood supply immediately. And as far as which uh, fibroids are most responsive to treatment, that's actually an excellent question. <clears throat> if we had more time, we could talk about all of that. Generally, um, subserosal or submucosal, subserosal or intramural um, fibroids that are on the surface of the uterus or in the uterine wall are most responsive to um, uterine artery embolization. If they're intracavitary, if, if there's a large component of them that are protruding into the uterine cavity, we still can treat them, but uh, sometimes those are more amenable to, to myomectomy. They can go into the cavity and kind of scoop them out. The other issue with those is if we do embolize, they can die and necrose, and then uh, they fall into the uterus and can cause uterine obstruction, or, the, or they pass them through the vaginal canal. So we do evaluate those things. That's part of the pr why we like that pre-procedure MRI, so we can evaluate that. That's a great question. I have a question about uh, deep venous thrombosis, you know, mm -hmm. most likely lower limb. When does the PCP decide to refer this patient to interventional radiologist? for thrombolytic therapy, you know, how does he make that decision? When to refer to us for DVT? Yes, ma'am. Well, at any time, we're happy to see them in clinic. Even if you're unsure, just send them to our clinic, and we'll um, be happy to do a consult and work them up and keep an eye on them. Um, the DVTs that we are treating are probably patients that have more come to an inpatient setting at that point. We're treating them more acutely in the hospital. Um, or if, if they're very symptomatic, they um, have really swollen, painful legs and extensive DVTs, like in their, it's mostly going to be femoral upper thigh DVTs, not necessarily calf DVTs, extending up into the pelvis and the legs. Um, but they'll have leg pain and swelling. They'll, they'll probably be more in a hospitalized setting. But again, go ahead and refer to us, and we'll work them up and see if, it, if it's amenable to treatment. Same uh, position there. Uh, back to the embolization of the fibroids uh -huh. issue. You mentioned that patients were getting two milligram a dilaudid or a dilaudid PCA pump post-op. Or how, how, where's that pain coming from, and how long is it expected to last? When can they be discharged? And yeah. Tell me more about that. So they start, ex I find in my experience, those patients start experiencing pain right when I start embolizing. Right when you start causing ischemia to those fibroids, they start experiencing pain in the IR suite. I usually like to start my PCAs before they even leave my angiography suite. As we all know, with pain, it's a very complex thing to treat, and if you can get ahead of it, you can stay on top of it. It's a lot harder to chase pain. Um, we usually give them a dilaudid PCA, um, and I also give them Toradol. Toradol is really good for pain management. Um, and there's lots of different papers on different ways you can preload them with some pain medicine. Sometimes some people say we, um, it helps to give lidocaine in our cocktail of beads. Lots of different stuff we can try. Um, but they start experiencing pain right away. Um, they're, it's crampy. They feel they'll start feeling really intense menstrual cramps. It'll be pretty intense the first night. We have it controlled by the next morning, and we send them home with Norco. And so it's, it's usually... Um, controlled with some Norco, and then they can switch to NSAIDs after that. It should get better within a few days, definitely within a week. And most go home the next day, most of the time. Some, a lot of people do these as outpatient even, and send patients home outpatient. We keep them overnight for pain control. That first night is the most painful. Any additional questions from the audience? They are. We do moderate sedation, fentanyl and Versed. Mm -hmm. But we're pretty light with that. Um, we don't really need a lot. It's mostly it's uncomfortable laying on our table. Um, they have to lay still. It just helps them relax. The only part of our procedure they really feel besides the cramping from the embolization is when we access that artery, but we give lidocaine for that too. So other than that, they don't really feel much. We can also do that with moderate sedation. We give a moderate sedation. Mm -hmm. We deliver to mess and anesthesia all down the vein um, prior to ablating, and that's a little uncomfortable for them. Um, we give them fentanyl and Versed as well. All right. 
Well, if there are no additional questions, our, our panelists can exactly. leave. Um, I just want to close with a couple of um, uh, thank yous to our vendors who have been outside and been so gracious. Uh, we have one more question. I'm sorry. One more question. Um, this question is for Dr. Steele. How many blood patches is one too many, especially for a repeat headache patient? And two, um, we'll do three non-targeted blood patches before we initiate a further workup for a potential CSF leak. Um, a lot of these headaches that are um, um, from intracranial hypotension, positional type headaches, um, a fair number of them can be um, located or um, suspected to be caused by a spinal CSF leak. So we'll do three non-targeted before we initiate the workup for a, for, um, a potential spinal leak. Okay. When, when we're treating just post-LP lumbar punctures, like post-LP spinal headaches, most of those respond with, with one blood patch. Um, rarely do we have to do two blood patches, and that usually takes care of it. All right, so if there are no additional questions. I just want to say thank you to our volunteers today. And also we had donations for this meeting from Siemens Medical Systems. They also have a very um, uh, strong interest in reaching out to communities um, to ensure best health care imaging for patients. We also had support from Philips and Southwestern Diagnostic Imaging, Texas Medical Liability Trust, and Grapevine, the Grapevine Convention Center was gracious enough to come out and provide us with some additional information on their wonderful town. Um, UT Southwestern uh, Health Resource um, ACO was supportive here as, long, as well as the UT Southwestern Department of Radiology. And I, of course, would like to thank each of you for attending. I hope that we can um, Go forward as partners in the future in helping you answer the questions to better treat our patients. We all have a vested interest in the practice of medicine in making sure that we can get to the right patient with the right test at the right time. And that's what this conference was about. And I very much appreciate that you have stayed engaged during this entire beautiful day at the Gaylord.